wrestling match um, that I'm having within myself and with God as to what these two titles mean. Um, these are two of the over 800 names that biblical scholars have identified in Scripture for Jesus. Um, and I think two of maybe, at least for me, the most impactful, um, the, the most um, staggering uh, titles given to Jesus himself. And so I want to I see what comes for us, this amazing revealing of what the Son of God is, what the Son of Man is. It is staggering in its impact to us. And so my prayer is that you are um, equally uh, amazed at what these two titles reveal as we take a look at them this morning. Son of God and Son of Man. Two natures. Jesus has two natures. One is deity and one is humanity. And so those two natures, those two names, those two titles, identities, um, the Bible says are equal. They're equally present in this man, Jesus. And so when we're talking about Jesus being the Son of God and the Son of Man, we're talking about the two equal natures. And this comes up in a lot of different scriptures that I'm not presenting to you. Philippians 2, John 17, Hebrews 1, Colossians 1, John 10. All of those passages name these titles and speak about how they are equally in Jesus, totally human, totally divine. Kind of crazy to me. So here's this, here's this title that is, is a conundrum for me. So Jesus is coming with the disciples on this given day, and he find, he's starting to collect, he's starting to gather his disciples. And he has Philip, and he says, hey, Philip, come with me, Andrew, Peter. Um, we're going to go. Um, on the way, he decides he wants to bring alongside Nathaniel. And so they come up to Nathaniel, and they have this amazing conversation, this amazing um, interaction where Jesus identifies Nathaniel first. And I'm thinking about your pastor, Tim. I'm hoping that he is sitting underneath some fig tree somewhere. I don't know what he's doing. I didn't ask. But I hope like Nathaniel, like Jesus saw Nathaniel, he's sitting underneath a fig tree just kind of getting all the good stuff from God, just taking it in. I'm hoping that that is happening so he comes back to you on fire and ready to go to lead you and serve you. Um, but Nathaniel is there, and as Jesus comes up to him, Jesus identifies him first. And he said, oh, here's an Israelite. Here's an Israelite. Some scriptures, some texts say, in whom there is no, a true Israelite, in whom there is no guile a true israelite in whom there is no guile and, and that that word means this translation translated it well it means that there's complete truth there is nothing hidden there's no secrets in this man he what you see is what you get he is honest without a fault here is a man with whom there is no guile and that word guile is a word that in the old testament um is revealed through another man who is Jacob. Jacob is a man, though, the Bible says, who was with guile back in Genesis. And Jacob, at another time, was sitting and laying down and had this amazing dream. And you can kind of hear the dream revealed in this text. Jacob's dream was of a ladder and angels going up and down. And God presented this dream to him and told him, basically in the dream, that he's going to be the father of nations and, you know, the rest of that story. Well, I think Nathaniel was doing a little Bible study in his head before Jesus shows up underneath the fig tree, and his Bible study is about the man of guile. The man is Jacob, and he's thinking about this ladder going up and down and the angels going up and down. And Jesus comes up to him and says, I saw you, Nathan. Lord, how did you see me? Oh, I saw you when you were by yourself. Nobody else was around. I saw you. You were underneath the fig tree. And then the whole rest of this conversation basically reveals that Jesus even knows what he was doing, what he was thinking. He was, Nathan, I know you. I got you, Nate. You were doing a Bible study in your head. You were 
thinking about the angels going up and down on the ladder from heaven to earth and this amazing relationship. And, and you were thinking about those things. And I'm sure Nathan's just blown away. And he's, wow, you saw me. He, he must have seen. Nobody else was there. How could he see me? Surely you are the true king of Israel. You are the son of God. Wow. And it doesn't say it exactly this way, but I imagine Jesus responding with, well, okay, yeah, you're right. I'm the son of God. But Nathan, get ready, because you are about to see the son of man. So we have these two titles that are interplay going back and forth with Jesus about who Jesus is, different times in Scripture. In the Old Testament, it's used a ton. Son of God is coming. Son of God, the, it, it, you can go to the Old Testament and find all kinds of passages of Scripture identifying the Son of God. He's coming. He's, they're prophesying about Him, right? They also, in the Old Testament, talk about the Messiah coming, the Son of Man coming. He's coming as well. So this is a, these are titles that are in Scripture all throughout. And so, Son of God, Son of Man, Jesus, you are the Son of God. I'll tell you, you're going to see the Son of Man. And so, let's take a look at these two titles. Son of God, what is the Son of God? Who is the Son of God? Well, it's Jesus, but what does that mean? What's the description of that? If I were to ask you to describe God, you would give me a great description. We all have an idea of who God is. He's the creator, right? The creator of all things. He's the God of love. He's the God of grace. He is the God omnipotent. That means he's all powerful. He has all power. He could separate seas if he wants to. He is all powerful. He's omnipresent. That means he's everywhere. The theologians say that he's everywhere. He's in everything. He sees everything. He's omniscient. That means he's all knowing. He knows what Nathan's thinking when he's not even there with Nathan and hearing Nathan talk about it. He knows what he's thinking. That means that he knows where you are at all times. He sees you at all times. Sorry, sorry Lord. <laughs> he sees you at all times. He knows what you're thinking at all times. You can't close your door to Jesus. He is the Son of God. So he has love. He's described by grace. He's described by mercy. He's described by justice. He's the God of sometimes wrath. So all of these descriptors, Scripture says, are in God, right? Jesus has equality with God, so they're also in Jesus. So the one walking and talking with them right now has all of God's character, has all of God's stuff in him. He is the Son of God. He also possesses the character of, I don't know if it's a character, he, he also possesses eternality. Okay? God's eternal. Never has been a time when God did not exist. Jesus is the Son of God, equal with God, Never has been a time when Jesus did not exist. That's why we read in the very first part of John, the very first chapter, the very first verse. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. All things were made. Nothing, nothing without Him was made that has been made. In Him was life. He's the light of mankind. Who are they talking about? Who's the Word of God? Jesus. He's the Son of God. And so he was there in the beginning, this text tells us, and many others tell us that. So there's never been a time that God has not been. Since Jesus possesses that attribute, there's never been a time that Jesus has not been. He is eternal. Wait a minute, that doesn't quite make sense, does it? Sure seems like there was a time when he didn't exist. The Bible says no. So everything that makes God, God, think about that. Everything that makes God, God is resident in Jesus. Okay? And Jesus says, but wait, Nathan. Nathaniel, you're going to see not just the Son of God. You're going to see the Son of Man. 
So something here is special about these two titles. Something's going to happen with the Son of Man that's different than the Son of God. And these two titles try to identify that for us. Nathan, you will see the Son of Man, and I would add, go to work. The Son of Man is going to do something. The Son of Man has come for a real significant reason that you can't anticipate. Maybe you do. Maybe you think you know what might be coming. So the Son of Man, what's the, what does that title mean? How does that description happen? The Son of Man is not only God, but He's the Son of Man. That means that everything that humans possess, everything that makes us human, everything is also resident in Jesus. Jesus is human. He is just like you. No wonder He understands us. He gets it. He is just like you and I. Everything that is resonant in you and I is resonant in Jesus, the Son of Man, apart from sin, right? The Bible says he's perfect. He's without sin. So he has everything that's us except sin. Unfortunately, we're the ones that have sin. And for some reason, Jesus is apart from that. So the Son of Man, he gets tired. Just like every human being gets tired because we wander around, we stay up too late at night, and we get tired. He had to sleep. Jesus had to sleep because the body, the human body, has to stop for a while and recollect its energy. He has to eat. Jesus had to sit down and have a meal every once in a while because he, like all human beings, had to get nutrition from his food for his body. He wept. Humans weep. When they cry, they are grieving about something or they're broken for some reason. Jesus wept. Scripture tells us that. He had to be tempted. Man, maybe one of the most human attributes. He was tempted by the devil. You and I are tempted all the time by the evil one. And so Jesus was tempted as well. He was tempted by God. By the, or he was tempted by the devil. And so why? Because that's what the devil does to humans. He tempts them tries to draw us away from God, and he does that through trickery. So all the things that make people people, all the things that make people people, Jesus possesses, apart from sin. Okay? How can this be? How is the, this? Just, it blows me away. How can Jesus be fully God with all the attributes of deity while at the same time being fully man with all the attributes of humanity? How could that be side by side in one person? There's only one person on the planet that has this capability. There's only one of him. The answer is, I think, found through the virgin birth. So the question of the virgin birth, the Bible says that the seed of deity comes into Mary, who is fully human. She is not divine. She is fully human. She has sin in her included. And the scriptures say that before she ever slept with her future husband, um, never had sexual relationships, that God came into her. And so deity sperm comes in and enters into human seed. And oh my goodness, what's percolating in Mary? The God-man is now percolating in Mary. And so she's found to be pregnant with the Holy Spirit, but there's a problem. Mary's human. Um, she possesses sin. How does the sin keep away from this baby Jesus while he's getting ready to be born? And the scriptures tell us that it's the task of the Holy Spirit to keep sin away from the holy child. So sin is kept away from everything else that's human about humanity is resonant in Jesus except for sin. The Holy Spirit is who kept Jesus se uh, separated, if that's the right way of describing that, from the problem of sin. That's how he could be born and called God with us, Emmanuel, without sin. The Holy Spirit had to do his stuff. Now there's a, there's a side issue for me related to this, which is a whole nother sermon. I'm going to just zip through it really quick. But this is a whole nother sermon. 
The reason that you can trust that the Holy Word of God is without error, that it's, it's, it's pure, it's unbroken, it's untarnished, how can that be? It was written by a whole ton of different people from different countries in different years, all put together. It's got to be messed up, right? It's got to be messed up. How is it that the Bible complaint can claim 2 Timothy 3, all Scripture is inspired by God? How could it possibly be that Scripture isn't tainted? Same way that you can trust that Jesus is without sin. The Holy Spirit's task was to keep the, the writing, the scribing of the Holy Word pure, unbroken. The job of the Holy Spirit was to keep the the writing and the preparations of the written word as it comes together, perfect, without sin, without error. And so you can trust the, the Bible that you're holding is without error, just as you can trust Jesus is without sin. Because of the same way, the Holy Spirit was involved, keeping that protected, keeping that safe. So the Bible also says that Jesus is the only begotten in the beginning he is the only begotten Son of God, John 3.16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, the one and only Son. That means only begotten means there's only one of Him. He's unique. He's one of a kind. He's a class by Himself. There is no one else like Him. There is only one of Him. That's why you can't have multiple messiahs. There's only one messiah. There's only one on the planet that is both equally God and man. And so Jesus is that person. He is begotten. The Jews understood this. This was what became a problem for them. Um, John 5 tells that story. John 5, 18, they tried to kill him when he, they heard him name that he was equal to God, that he and the Father were one. John 5, 18, for this reason, the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him because he was not only breaking the Sabbath by, I don't know, walking around picking grain off the field, but he was even calling God his own father, oh, making himself equal to God. What is that? You know what that is? That's blasphemy. That's absolute blasphemy. Jesus can't be God. He's walking around with us. He's even sinning. He's doing stuff on the Sabbath. He's not, he's, not, he's not obeying the laws. He isn't God as well. We got to get rid of him. No, we got to kill him. We got to take him down. So, wow. We call him um, the Son of God and the Son of Man. He has a divine nature, he has a human nature. Somehow those two come together in one person. No wonder in one moment he could be hungry, and in the next, the next moment he could feed 5,000 people. No wonder in one moment he could be thirsty, and in the next moment he could walk on water. No wonder in one moment he could die. Only, only humans can die. Spirits don't die right? Humans die. So no wonder in one moment he can die, but in another moment he can come back to life. You know anybody like that? Not me. Only one. There's only one. So Jesus has what I call a function purpose. Uh, he, he has a reason for being here. Why is this all happening? And, and so I looked up and I looked up I Googled to help my sermon get better. I Googled son of. So he's the son of God. He's the son of man. So I Googled son of. Came up with a whole bunch of responses from Google. So did you know you can be the son of anarchy? You can be the son of liberty. You can be the sons of the church. I would argue the sons and daughters of the church. You can be the sons of thunder, James and John. You can have sons of the ministry. And so the son title, 
identifies not only a biological relationship with your parents, mom and dad, who bring what it takes for you to be a human, but you also have the title son or daughter as a role. There's something you are to do, and Jesus had that same thing. He has a role. He's, so when I went on a, a mission trip not too many years ago to Belize, and uh, before we left, the church brought us up and prayed over us, laid hands on us, and kind of sent us out as their ambassadors, as their sons of the church. That was our task, to represent the church in a faraway place, telling this other community about who Jesus was on behalf of the ones that sent us. So you and I have a functioning ministry, a role, a purpose. It's not just biological. So when Jesus is called the Son of God, the Son of Man, it's not just biological. There's a role that he's fulfilling. Well, Jesus, Philip says, John 14, been walking along with you, the, been here for a long time. We think you're amazing. Maybe you're the Messiah. Not sure. But listen, Jesus, if you'll just show us the Father, just show us who he is, we'll believe. Remember Jesus' response? He says, Philip, have I been with you all this time and you still don't know me? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? Philip didn't get it. He couldn't put together the conundrum of Son of God and Son of Man. He couldn't figure it out. He knew all about it. They'd been anticipating the Messiah forever. They knew that someone was coming from God. So they understood that concept. But even the disciples, as they're with him, standing in front of him, they couldn't put those pieces together. So you guys, you guys like selfies. <laughs> I know. Jesus is God's selfie. So when it was time for God to make himself visible to the world, Jesus entered in. So when you see Jesus, you're seeing the face of God. When you see a picture or when you have an image in your mind of Jesus, the man, that's the selfie of God. Guys, don't you know who I am? I'm God. I'm standing right here in front of you, Philip. If, if you just show us God, okay, but if you just show us God, then we'll believe. So he has these two natures, these two ministerial responsibilities, one in man and Jesus, and it's powerful, it's amazing. No wonder, you know, the that Christmas passage now has new meaning for me when I think about it. I, Isaiah 9, 6, for unto us a child is born. Who's born? The human Jesus. For unto us a son is given. One's given, never born. One's born through the human mother, and he shall be the Emmanuel. Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. Um, so of his eternality, they had this conflict with Jesus when he got into a head battle with the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And John 8 says in part of this conflict, are you greater than our father Abraham? He died, and so did the prophets. Who do you think you are? Your father Abraham rejoiced at the thought, this is Jesus talking, your father Abraham rejoiced at the thought of my coming one day. What? Abraham's, what, 800 years? A long time ago? You mean you think you talked to Abraham? And they said to him, you are not even 50 years old, Jesus. You can't possibly have talked to Father Abraham about this. And Jesus responds, very truly, I tell you, before Abraham was, I am. Remember that text? Wow. It's starting to come together. I'm, I'm starting to get it. You starting to get it? It's crazy. But why the two names in one person? Why is this happening? Um, I remember way back when I was saved, when I accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I was about 
14. And um, I was asked a question, Paul, do you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God? I asked that to Chris on a day up here. You guys all heard the answer. I gave the same answer. Yes, I do. I believe that he is the Son of God. I believe that he is going to take me, if I believe, he's going to take me to heaven. Do you guys believe that? Isn't that why we accept Christ as our Savior, to go to heaven? Trick question. <laughs> There's a little more to it, right? Yes, it seems like, yeah, I want to, I, I want to be saved. I want to be secure. I want to know that I'm going to go to heaven. I want to be with Jesus forever. I don't want to die and end up in hell. Man, I, I got pictures in my head of what that is. I don't want any part of that. Jesus, take me with you. And so, so much of our focus when we jump into the boat with Jesus is about going to heaven. Well, this scripture is telling us that it's a little more than that. It's also about the ladder going up and down and angels and your prayers going up and about what you need and answers from angels coming down about how to have that need fulfilled in you here and now. So Nathaniel, you're going to see the Son of Man go to work. So it's not just about what's at the end. It's not just about me getting to heaven. It's also about us recognizing that God has a kingdom plan. It's all through scripture. The kingdom plan is that God's got control of what's happening in heaven. The kingdom of heaven is alive and well, and he's got that going on. He's in charge of it. He also has a kingdom plan here on earth. The kingdom plan got messed up when Adam and Eve were there. And all they had to do was one thing, or not do one thing. And Satan did his thing and whispered in their ear, and said, oh, pff, you can do it. What's really going to happen? He loves you. He's not going to do anything to you. Go ahead. Take a bite. They take a bite, and you know the rest of the story. They basically take the kingdom keys that God gave Adam, and they hand them to Satan. So now, no wonder the scriptures tell us in Job and, and in Timothy that Satan is the ruler of this world. Satan is the one who has the keys to this kingdom. Well, I think that the kingdom plan is God wants his kingdom back. He doesn't want Satan to be the ruler of the kingdom anymore. And so he's, he also makes a promise. He says, I'm going to do that through man. We're only going to take the kingdom back through man. But I can't find any righteous men. Who am I going to do that through? And so he has to break in himself, become a man, in order to find one righteous man on the earth that can take his kingdom back. And so you know the rest of the story, how that goes. And so there, there's the reason. Um, the one who comes to steal, kill, lie, destroy. Is there some lying going on right now? Big time. I, I don't know in my entire lifetime have I ever seen more evidence of deceit and lying and manipulation in the world. Satan, folks, is alive and well. We're hearing it all around us. You, it's, it, you can't, and it's not just political. I'm not just naming political. It's in all areas. We have to be so discerning. You should be praying for that. You have to be so discerning to make sure that you see truth in what you're pursuing it's everywhere and so it's prophesied in Genesis and other places that the head of the snake will be crushed by the seed of a woman why didn't God just come in and do it why didn't God just wipe Satan out I've always wondered that haven't you wondered that why didn't God just do it easy he prophesied, he told us that. He made a promise to us he would not do that. He told us that he will do it through the Son of Man. Not through the Son of God. The Son of God empowers it. The Son of Man accomplishes it. And so there's two tasks in one person. And that's what the prophecy is through Genesis 3.15. Um, so we have these two amazing titles. Uh, what do we do with it? Nathan, you're going to see the Son of Man go to work. So you know that in Scripture, there's really no divisions. Um, the chapters, verses, the numbers, those were all added later. That was for all of us 
who can't figure things out very easy, we've got to have a number to go find a scripture passage. When they were written, there were no divisions of text. And so what's the very next thing that happens in this story? The very next, sec- the very next section of the story after Jesus says to Nathaniel, okay, you're going to see the Son of Man. He's going to go to work. You're going to see angels ascending and descending from earth to heaven, heaven to earth. The connection's getting remade. The connection's getting rebuilt. The kingdom's coming to this place. And I love the very next story, the very next text. It starts out with chapter 2. It's not really there. On the third day at a wedding took place in Cana of Galilee. Nathaniel's there. Philip's there. The disciples so far that Jesus has collected are there. And Jesus is there, and he's celebrating. Jesus is a social animal. He, he's human. He loves a party. If you were having a party, you'd invite him because he loves to laugh, and he loves to drink Kool-Aid. <laughs> I'm a Baptist. Don't, me- <laughs> don't mess with me, man. He loves to go to a party, and at this party, it's just going great, and I'm sure he's having a fun time and celebrating. You know, in Scripture, the Bible tells us that wine is used in celebration of all kinds of things. One of them is weddings. The Bible tells us that that wine has a good purpose. It's used as a celebration. There's a bad purpose, and the Bible also tells you don't go there. Don't misuse it. Don't abuse it. But wine is used, you clink glasses. You guys are nodding. You know what I'm talking about. You clink glasses and you toast something that you're celebrating. That's a biblical thing. And they're doing it at this wedding. And all of a sudden, mom comes up to her son, the son of God, and she says, Jesus, they've run out of wine. I know you. I know who you are. I know you could take care of this. Do something for him. Hey, remember that? Woman, it's not my time. I don't want to be revealed as to who I am yet. They don't know who I am. It's not the right time. I know who you are, son, son of God. Come on. Okay. Hey, servants. It's an amazing story. Servants, get these jugs, these 120, 150-gallon ceramic jugs, take them down to the river, fill them up and bring them back. Jesus tells them to do that. And so they do that. They grab these jugs, they go down to the river. The very first miracle that Jesus performs as the Son of Man happens when he's not even there. Did you ever think about this one? It happens when he's, they're on their way back. He doesn't whoosh, breathe on the stuff. He doesn't put his finger in and spin it around and turn it into wine. He, he, it happens on their way back, the scripture says, the water changes to the best tasting wine that they've had yet at this party for celebration. It's the best stuff. When God dives in and does something special, it's always the best. You have it in your life. You love thinking about, you ought to tell more about the stories when it didn't seem like Jesus was there, but the miracle happened and your life changed or somebody in your family's life changed or a healing happened. Man, on the way back from the river, best wine at the party. Wait a minute, why did we wait to the end of the week to have the best wine? Steward, why did you bring the, the stuff out at the end? You always bring the good stuff out at the beginning. You know what? Sometimes God does his best stuff in the later years. At the end of the party. At the end of your life. God does good stuff. We dread the end of our lives. Maybe we should anticipate the good stuff being revealed at the end of our lives. Yeah? Yeah? Great thought, isn't it? So my sense is is that we're supposed to learn from this that the Son of God empowers the Son of Man. Um, you know, I, I can just see Jesus, the human guy, sitting there going, you know, twitching his nose, 
like Bewitched. That's a really old, you guys all know that. That's a really old one. He's twitching his nose and saying, Son of God, come on, God, do something. And through Jesus, something happens. I don't know if that's how it goes. It kind of seems like that's how it goes. Jesus has the ability to do anything he wants. His power is from God as the Son of God through the Son of Man, and the water changes to wine. Very first thing that happens. I'm waiting at the party for the wine to show up. Sometimes you wait at the party for the wine to show up. And so we come to church and we listen to a really good sermon and we go home and we feel like we we're okay. Haven't done anything other than listen. And I hear in this text Jesus telling us, go to the river. You got to go to the river. Servants, you got to go to the river. Get the water. Jesus, just do the miracle. No, go to the river, do what you've got to do in ministry so that on the way back you can see what God's going to do through the Son of Man. Powerful? It's an amazing thought. Church, you're called to go to the river. Don't sit here. You're called to go and do the ministry function, not just wait for heaven to show up, but to recognize heaven's already here. And God wants you to do ministry functions so that he can show the power of who he is here on earth in his kingdom in this time. If he doesn't, who's going to be visible? Satan's going to be visible. He's clear as a bell to me right now. We need to see Jesus visible. And it happens through us. Amen? Amen. 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 There's a song.